Like the short term middle business is just like the flipping business in the sense that you're always on, you're always game, you're always having to, uh, you know, focus on customer service, et cetera, et cetera. Storage is like, man, you, it really is, you set it and forget it. One of my, I have 50,000 square feet that's managed by one person, hmm. 396 tenants. She's awesome. And I call her maybe once a month. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Travis Backham is the founder and CEO of Balcomy Capital. Balcomy Capital is a boutique firm for high net worth and high income individuals that specializes in the seldomly invested in but well-known property type that performs a lot better than others. Travis, welcome to the show. Hey, nice, nice, to, nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, Travis. I appreciate it. There are three questions that the three questions I ask every guest that comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Yeah. So I started in the residential space, uh, buying single family homes, specifically foreclosures back in 2012. Um, I didn't have a lot of money. So that I was kind of, um, that that's, if I was going to get into real estate investing, that was going to be the only way to do it. Or at least that's how I saw it. And I really wanted to be in the residential space. Uh, over the next eight years, we bought over 400 uh, houses, and then we realized that you know this is probably not where we want to be long term. Uh, it was going to be a hard uh, place to ever retire from because of the the plate spinning and the wheels that are all, always spinning in the residential space. Made a big switch to self storage. Um, ex for the most part, exclusively self storage. We have a few, few you know hobby projects that we do. Um, but yeah, we, we own over uh, 1800 units of self storage facilities in Texas, one in Oklahoma, uh, very large. We, we focus on buying like a mom and prop property and then expanding it. Uh, you can make a tremendous yield doing that. And, uh, as far as moving forward, we're going to focus on the acquisition and the development of, uh, class A self storage facilities. And that's really, really cool. I love that the 400 houses that's that's a lot of houses to buy it's a lot of closings that's a lot of paperwork like how in the world and and do you still i mean were those rentals were those houses that yeah but live? so so you had, to, you had to buy them that's 400 transactions and then right. you had to sell them which is another 400 transactions and not including the utility payments and the constructions and the massive amount of employees it takes to manage that stuff and so um, yeah, that's that's we bought in like I said in 2012, we bought our first house, bought another house late 2012, 2013, bought four houses. We started, we kind of were tripping up or falling forward or failing forward, whatever you have have. So we mess up and be like, man, on the next one, we're gonna fix that. And then we get to the point where we were buying five to seven houses a month, then 10 to 15 houses a month. It was kind of backloaded, meaning that we kind of uh, you know, ramped it up and then 2016, 17, 18. We bought um, a ton of houses. So 2016, we bought 56. Uh, 2017 was 87. Then 2018 was 91 until October of 2018. And then I got, I was so burned out of trying to keep it all together. I I hadn't been able to take a break, no vacation. We didn't have money for vacation. We were just continually putting the money back into the system. And uh, I was like, this sucks. Like. Right. I, like, give me a job for 75,000 bucks. I, like, I'll take it immediately. Right. You know, and that wasn't even what we lived on. You know, it was just like, I was just so miserable that I was willing. Like, I remember seeing a homeless guy once panhandling and I'm like, man, like, dude, he's got it. He's got it so easy. All he has to do is hold out his hat and get paid money and have some sob story. You know, here I am like trying to keep every banker and uh, construction guy or, you know, a contractor at bay and, in private investors and employees afloat, like it was like all of me. It's like that that statue with the dude with the world on his shoulders. You know, it's a horrible way of making wealth and making income. I'll just tell you that, and I'll I will I will debate anyone on that topic because I have the stories to prove it. <laughs> but yeah, it it was um, there was a, we made a hard decision in 2018 to quit, and I just like started. We had seven at that time. We had 40 renovations going, 42 renovations. And 72 single family home rentals. And we just, I was like, I'm just going to wind down and restart. I'll, I, like in my head, I was like, we should have like 700 grand when this, all this is done. Everyone will be paid back, debit card or credit cards will be paid back. In reality, that's not what happened when we, like the, the values were greatly skewed. The renovation budgets were way under budget. 
Uh, and you know, when you, you go 20 grand off of a renovation, it's not like that money just comes out of nowhere. It, that's right. a profit from another deal. You have to put in that and you're not able to live on that. You're not able to pay payroll on that. And so it, no one, I have not met anyone. There, There is three operators in America and I know most of the massive house flipping operators. There's three operators that I think actually do well on it. Mm. Otherwise everyone is struggles. I, I, I see more people struggle on the single family game than I see people successful in the single family game. And that, well, you guys were strictly flipping or were you, I heard you say rentals or yeah, we had 72 rentals to go. We were trying to my in, in, before everything just kind of dried up. I was planning on just like we're gonna buy rentals and and then when I get to 300 rentals, I'm not flipping houses anymore and I'm firing everybody. And I'm gonna hire a really smart person to manage all three of those and I'm and I'm gonna retire because I hate this so much. But you have issues like when you have 72 rentals and they're class C, class B rentals, and you have HVACs, those tenants are too busy surviving to replace the filter yep you know and if they're not surviving they're probably you know like just doing other things that will cause them to forget to take care of the property or they just flat flat don't care and uh and so your ac goes out and then that's all the landlord's fault because he put in a crappy ac even though that new the ac was new 12 months ago uh, they just, they, you know, like we had this really rough, uh, small apartment complex. The tenants would actually take the fiberglass uh, uh, filter out and like strip it and put it in their joints. So because it, he, and I was, why are, why are y'all doing this? Like, what, what the hell? This is not good for you. Like, oh, I guess it's a little higher. I'm like, gosh, oh my God. Just give me out. I, I just leave. I just want to be out of this so fast. <laughs> it was, that was, that was the worst. I think it's still the worst property in that in that market. Just such a I don't the guy I sold it to is a friend of mine now and he's still every time I talk to him, he hasn't gotten it full. Wow. So all it, right. It so now we know why six eight five seven. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I got out of it. Now we know why you got out of it. What did you do with the rental portfolio? How did you unload that? Just sold it. Yeah, off. so so in 2018, in October 2018, I actually ran out of money. We just were so because everything everything I just explained, just we were out of cash. And so I was like, well, I can't make payroll and I don't really even like these t employees anymore because they, they can't, they're, you know, that guy is the one that under, under, uh, underbid the, the property. He paid too much for the property. This guy is the one that does, paid the drywall bill three times the same guy and didn't realize that, you know, like all y'all are fired. And so I fired everybody on one, one day and I took, I went home, 42 renovations, 72 houses. I list everything we had. And so like I spent two or three days, I was a real, am a real estate broker. And uh, I'd listed everything I had. And if it was a half done project, we would list it. You know, like if somebody wants to buy it for what we owe on it, we'll take it. And so I, at that point, I went, I just took tranches of five. Like I'll take these five houses and I'll renovate these five houses with these five crews. And then these five houses and these five houses. And eventually the crews didn't like the way I, I all of a sudden they, they had the gravy train. They would just submit an invoice, get paid. And I was like, no, you missed the spot, missed the spot. I was just all of a sudden running my business like a business and I, and they were used to my construction manager just writing a check whenever they needed any money for anything for whatever reason and then um yeah and then the 72 houses like we sold some tranches of those uh you know the property manager was still in money uh we found out i found out after everyone every i canned everybody that the property manager was actually just kind of milking us you know, like not, you know, telling us to replace vinyl plank that have been already using his construction company to replace all, do all the work. So real bad, just real sh sh environment. Honestly, it's the worst. That's the only word I can think about using. Um, and uh, yeah. And so we just, it took me 28 months to unwind all that. And then wow. we were out of it. We didn't have most of it. Most of the debt was paid off. If the debt hadn't been paid off, we had agreements for those people. And so every bank, despite that catastrophe every bank got paid back plus interest every hard money lender got paid back plus interest every investor got paid back uh, plus interest and if they didn't get paid back plus interest then we were setting up monthly payments with them and so my thought is if i could just took care of the people that helped me get to where i was then they will help me get to where i want to go and right so and so you said all right so you got enough enough of the of the housing game that worry out that killed you what uh what did what are you gonna do differently because i mean it's one thing and i'm no. not gonna i'm gonna offend you here maybe a little bit but you seem like somebody that likes to shoot straight so yes. it's one thing to say well you know employees did this employees did that employees did this 
but there has to be some lessons for you in there as well. Like sure. from, a, from a leadership perspective and also from a, in my next company, in my next version of real estate, I'm gonna do something differently. What are some of those? Yeah, yeah. And thank you for calling me out on the, uh, the, the finger pointing. So to say that a different way is uh, not everything that happened in my business was my fault. Sure. I did, you know, it was, there was so much going on. I didn't know the guy was getting, the drywall guy was getting paid three times for one right. job, you know, but everything was my responsibility. And that's when I took, you know, and I was so burned out. I'd have been like just slagging, slagging. And then, then I'm like, all right, like for me to get out of this without losing everything, I got to make some hard decisions. And so yeah. that's when, so the 28 months of me, like, you know, the first seven or eight months of that was pretty painful because we were still out of cash. People were wanting money. We were having to explain the same story over and over. And so one thing that I did uh, to choose, you know, I chose not to do. One thing that happened when I decided to um, take everything home is I re read Ray Dalio's book, uh, Principles. Mm. Um, good news for everybody that doesn't want to read a book that's 1,800 pages, whatever. Um, you can just get on youtube and, and google ray dalio principles there's actually an animated version of that entire book that goes that's covered very entertaining that's done in 34 minutes you can learn all the principles in the book principles that you need to and so um one of those principles for me is if i'm going to invest in something it has to be making money every day every week or every month and it has to pay cash flow every day every week every month so flipping a house is just out of the question like we might flip a house just just to make a quick buck, but we're not going to build a business flipping houses ever again. Right. right. That, and I don't recommend anyone doing that if you're listening to this. And so, um, so by focusing on assets to make it money every day, every week, every month, we eliminated most of the stuff we had been doing. And so, um, the highly speculative, highly value add house buying business. And so, uh, so originally we started buying short term rentals before Airbnb took off. Those are working really well. Those make money every day or every week. Uh, and then we're like, all right, hospitality assets are pretty risky in a recession. Right. They don't perform very well. So we're going to need a hedge. So how do we hedge? Let's find the most, what is the opposite of a really, you know, hospitality makes really great yield in a good, uh, good market, especially in a good, a good, good economy and a good market. What's the market or what's the asset class that we need to buy in to make sure we hedge for this. And that's where we found stor storage. And then after we bought our first Portfolio, storage portfolio i'm like i'm selling the short-term rentals <laughs> because because self-storage is so easy compared to you know driving friday evening when i'm hanging out with my son and having to fix a whatever you know whatever the heck wi-fi password issue or something like that driving 20 minutes and 20 minutes it goes an hour of my life and just also that lady might give me a five-star review you know right. and I'm like that's not the life i want to live i want to set it and forget it like this is like the short term middle business is just like the flipping business in the sense that you're always on, you're always game, you're always having to, uh, you know, focus on customer service, et cetera, et cetera. Storage is like, man, you, it really is, you set it and forget it. One of my, I have 50,000 square feet that's managed by one person, mm. 396 tenants. She's awesome. And I call her maybe once a month. And so, like, if I think of her, oh, I probably need to call, see what's going on. Sometimes it's just send a text because she has it down. I can pull up immediately. I can pull up the dashboard and realize, oh, 98.1% of our tenants have paid on the fifth part of fifth of the month. Don't have to worry about it. She'll call me if there's a fire, a, a robbery or a theft, or if something catastrophic is happening. Otherwise, I just need to call her and make sure she knows I'm thinking of her and that she's valuable to my company and that we really think her, or are thankful for her, that sort of thing. So right it's it's the opposite of like having to like do massive operations and take care of human beings uh in short-term rentals <laughs> oh human beings in short-term rentals or even i mean just just looking at uh um, generally I, wait just going back to the flipping business i mean my gosh like i'm with you man i did a lot of it not nearly as much as you did but i did a lot of it and it's like I just, I couldn't go back to it. I couldn't go back to it. too many moving parts. And I think, I think part of what I hear you saying here is building, because for some people flipping is fun. Like they want to do that. They want the phones. They want, they want the busyness. They want the contractors and the painters and this and that and the closings. And I mean, there's something, they just enjoy that frenetic activity. Uh, but it sounds like for you, you've really want to build a business that kind of suits who you are. 
maybe and not so much necessarily chasing the like, hey, I told him massive well, empire you're building. So, you know, in 2018, when I wrote down principles of how I want my life to look, yeah, I also wrote down like, because I was so frustrated and sad and angry that I hadn't been able to create the life I wanted in eight years of flipping houses or six years of flipping houses. And so I'm like, what do I really want? I'm like, well, I, I want star season passes. I want map season passes. I want this. I want that. I want to be able to mountain bike. I want to go to four vacations a year with my family. I want to go on four getaways with my wife. All the stuff that I'm writing down, I'm like, I'm going to create this now and fund this environment as opposed to the, my business owning me. I'm going to actually own the business and, and it's going to serve me the way I want it to serve. And so that's that's another reason why short term rentals are gone and uh, self storage is is where we're headed because we just you know I can go mountain biking on Monday and I can go mountain biking on Friday and then Tuesday Wednesday Thursday I can knock all the stuff out I need and sometimes oh. I don't even have those three things that when we're raising capital we're really busy but when we're when we aren't raising capital we're just looking for the next deal and it, that takes three or four to five hours a week to do. Right. What's a deal you're working on right now? Uh, you know, there, there has been incredible interest, obviously, in the self-storage space. Yeah. And I'm thinking back from when I first started really learning about and investing in commercial real estate, which is now seven years ago. Uh, you know, self-storage was it was warm-ish, you know, and it became a very hot asset class. I think it is still has a lot of attraction uh, for a lot of people. But well, what what's a deal you're working on right now? And why is, why is it in particular... Um, a great deal. Sure, sure. To, um, yeah, I would like to hit on the reason why self storage is hot right now is just to work from home is primarily the reason. And then there's a lot of traffic or a lot of train transitioning of housing. So those two things are driving a ton of demand because if you're if you're at home, an Airbnb who pays a ton of money, since you're talking about short term, they pay a ton of money for their employees, and they're they literally said, hey, indefinitely, you can work remotely. You can work wherever you want. We're not going to tier your salary. Like Facebook is tiering people's salary uh, depending on where they live. So me living in Waco, Texas, if you work for Facebook, you're going to make a lot less than if you work in San Francisco. It's called like, they call it like the work, ag work market algorithm or something like that. But Airbnb is like, you can work indefinitely. So several buddies of mine in Waco that they would never worked for like a – national company now just they work for a, a california company and they make like one hundred thirty thousand dollars. it's a huge salary in waco and so um so what that said like now that you can work at home indefinitely you just clear out the room that you had all your boxes in your storage room and now that's your office and so a lot of that's happening uh the deal we're working on right now is in texas it's uh austin msa it's a city called georgetown texas it's the uh wealthy or most expensive fastest growing suburb of boston um and it is it's grown 35 percent in five years and wow. so wow. a healthy growth is two percent a year according to gallup um so it should have grown 10 percent and it three and a half x that so uh, we're building a huge uh one of the last uh c1 zone mar uh, areas meaning c1 is a zoning that uh allows storage by uh special use permit um, so there's not going to be that many places that anyone can even build a, a storage facility or get permission to build a storage facility. So we're building it at the corner at a major intersection in one of the last zoning uh, plots that is allowed to build storage. Uh, it's 967 units. Mm. It's 107,000 square feet. It's man It's going to be managed by Extra Space, which is about to be soon to be the largest facility owner in America. Um, they have some of the highest or some of the most advanced technology. We're going to get that thing filled up really quick. It's going to be awesome. Um, it looks more like a hotel than it does a self-storage facility. It is gorgeous. It's beautiful. And, uh, you know, our, our cost is somewhere around 17 million for that stabilized value, uh, on a five year is 26 million stabilized value on a 10 years closer to 33 million. That's and cool. That is based on a five and a half cap, which is where public REITs are still buying. Wow, that's cool. I wish we had more time to dig into. Maybe have to have you back on the show here in a few months and, and just follow up and and get the update on uh, on that project because that I mean that's one. So it's a development deal, right? Yeah. So there's a lot ground of people up. that are afraid. Yeah, ground up deal. So people are afraid of development right now in general. Uh, you're in self storage, which yes, it's a hot asset class, but I think on a on a probably dollar for dollar, uh, you know, multifamily to self-storage, the, the dollars probably don't even compare self-storage still doesn't, hasn't been trading nearly as much as 
maybe what multifamily has. So I think you're still in a really cool asset class on that front. Uh, you're in a booming town in a, in a C1, what do you call it? The C1 zoning. I mean, yeah. All of those things together sound like a, a really fantastic project. Uh, give us just maybe the, the 20 second version of, let's see, we're recording this on May 30th. What, what, what is capital doing right now? Like what are, what are some, when you have an awesome project like this, any challenges on that front, any successes on raising yeah. capital in this environment? Yeah. So I, I'd break it down to people with high net worth. Uh, individuals and then ultra high net worth individuals hmm. high net worth individuals which is probably where me and you would fall in um we our available cash is either on the sidelines we're not gonna put anywhere or it's in deals right and we're and we're living off of our income i don't have an income but um ultra high net worth individuals they are uh still interested sporadically the hard thing about storage is you know most people's uh visual or mental picture of a storage facility is just a crappy like metal building with some boats around it maybe a breaking bad meth rv or something like that and and so it's not really well um well appreciated at this point but but yeah i, I ultra high net worth individuals are still uh, still uh committing uh for deals they are running bigger checks uh, you also have bar, you have uh, private equity. You got family offices. Um, those come with a lot of strings attached. A lot of you basically lose a lot of your your control that way. But if it's you know if you want to get a deal done in 2023, eight and a quarter percent interest with wherever the heck inflation is, uh, that might be your only option. Right, right. Very, very cool. I love it, Travis. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show today. I certainly appreciate it. I learned a lot from you. Certainly from the pains of flipping 400 houses. Uh, and then exiting that, finding what you're into now, why you love it. I mean, the idea that your phone doesn't ring certainly speaks to my heart. That's a, that's an amazing uh, asset class to be in. I'll call you once a month and we'll see, uh, see how things are going. So very, very cool. If our listeners want to get in touch with you and learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, the best way is on our website. It's www.investinstoragedeals.com investinstoragedeals.com. We will make sure we put that there in the show notes. Travis, thank you again for coming on today. I do appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen, if you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.